Hello, everyone. Today we have Matthew, and uh, he's going to talk about the reversible microdynamics on the stochastic six vertex model. I think we can start. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. I'll share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen? Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Today I'll be discussing, uh, I'll be describing a Markov chain on height functions on the square lattice, which um, preserves the uh, Gibbs measures of the six vertex model. Okay, so uh, what is the plan? So first I'll describe, uh, I'll give, just to give some context, I'll give uh, a little bit of discussion about surface growth models in general. Uh, and then um, I'll define the six vertex model and define the probability measures, which are going to be uh, relevant for us. And then um, I'll present the, the markup chain and, and state the main results. And then um, I'll try to give uh, I'll try to give some uh, indication of the construction of where the uh, markup dynamics come from and how they're related to the uh, sort of in a natural way to the Yang-Baxter equation of the six vertex model. Okay, so first, just a tiny bit about uh, surface growth models. Um, so models for surface growth um, sort of uh, arise, or sort of are very useful in many uh, areas of science and engineering to model um, naturally arising uh, processes where there's sort of a, an interface uh, separating two, uh, sort of an, an evolving interface uh, separating two uh, different substances. So for example, fluid flow in a porous medium is one natural example, or um, the, uh, the growth of a bacterial colony in a, in a petri dish. Uh, okay, and so we'll sort of uh, restrict ourselves to the case where the surface can be um, modeled as the graph of a height function over r to the d. And, um, and so that so this this interface is given by the, the graph of this height function and the height function is evolving in time. So for example, in this picture here, I have a configuration of the particle system ASEP, the asymmetric simple exclusion process, asymmetric simple exclusion process. And um, each uh, configuration, which is just a placement of particles on a, on a one dimensional lattice, uh, corresponds to uh, a height function. So uh, a large, a very large um, class of models um, share, called the KPZ universality class, share three uh, characteristic properties. And so these are the properties. So the, um, the dynamics, uh, so for all models in the KPZ class, by definition, the dynamics tends to force large fluctuations away from the mean and the height function back towards the mean. So they're, uh, these are smoothing dynamics. Um, the speed of growth of the height function at a point, so the speed of uh, the, the drift, uh, the rate of drift upward or downward of the height function at a point, depends only on the local slopes of the height function near that point. So, so the, the rate of drift at a point can't depend on the global height profile. It can only depend on uh, the slopes at that point, and it can't even depend on the higher derivatives. Okay, and so the, the noise in the model, the randomness should be uh, uncorrelated in, in space and time. I think that will be, okay, so I just wanna just define uh, one thing and just to a little illustrate the second point on the previous slide a little bit more. So as we said, so uh, suppose that I have, um, so suppose that I have some height function and sort of around this point, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit rough, but around this point, its average slope is rho, then um, uh, sort of at leading order, the growth rate of the height function at this point um, should be uh, determined by that slope rho. And the function which tells us that growth rate, uh, we, we'll denote that by j, and that's usually called the current. Okay, so uh, in general, um, for a 
for KPZ surface growth model, for KPZ class surface growth model, we expect that um, after rescaling space and time potentially, and, and looking at, and possibly after rescaling the height function, um, there's this decomposition of the height function as its mean plus a fluctuation, which is small at the largest scale. And so, and this um, at the largest scale, this mean height function satisfies this hydrodynamic limit equation. It's sort of that's a, sort of a general, I guess, ansatz for what happens. And then. And then the fluctuation field should satisfy this, should be the solution, at least, yeah, the fluctuation field should be the solution to this uh, stochastic PDD. So here, W is a space-time white noise, um, delta is Laplacian, and Q is a quadratic form, which is related to the original growth model um, uh, because of the fact that it should be proportional to the Hessian of the current, that, that current function. So, so it's a sort of a general conjecture that it's sort of a, a heuristic conjecture that um, all surface growth models in the KPZ class should be uh, described by the, the evolution of the fluctuation field after possibly after uh, rescaling space and time appropriately should be uh, described by the KPZ equation. Um, so in one plus in, in one space dimension, so if d equals one, so we have a height function over one dimensional space, uh, the behavior of solutions to the KPZ equation um, is conject, there are, uh, the behavior of the solutions is, is heuristically well understood. And in particular, the critical exponents, which describe the size of the height function fluctuations um, are known at a, uh, well, they're not, it's not proven, this is not a proven thing, but. They are uh, they are expected to have certain values, and these expectations have been confirmed rigorously for several concrete examples of KPZ growth models. And in two space dimensions, um, the situation is a little bit different in the sense that lar the large scale behavior of solutions to the KPZ equation is expected to depend on the signature of that quadratic form Q. So, in particular, if the determinant of Q is negative, then we're in the anisotropic KPZ class. And if the determinant of Q is positive, we're in the isotropic KPZ class. And the, these two um, uh, height functions have different uh, critical uh, scaling exponents. Um, okay, so, so in other words, if I have some two-dimensional surface growth model, the Hessian of the current determines the large scale behavior in, uh, yeah, the Hessian of the current determines the large scale behavior. Um, so just to give some idea of, of uh, things that people have uh, computed in the past. So in the, in the case of ASEP, which I mentioned previously, um, the stationary measures are known. There are these very explicit Bernoulli product measures, namely uh, one places a particle at each site with probability rho independently. Um, and the size of the height function uh, fluctuations are known. So we, we see these critical exponents, one half and one third, which are, um, which confirms the uh, expectation um, and uh, of the of these general conjectures, and uh, the current has a simple explicit one. And then in two plus one dimensions, there are various uh, instances of uh, of Markov chains uh, acting on tilings of the plane, and so, uh, or in other words, Markov chains acting on Daimler models. And so in each of these cases, the translation invariant Gibbs measures are stationary. Um, the uh, size of the height function uh, fluctuations at a point over a large time uh, have been uh, computed. And these again agree with uh, conjectures. And um, the current has been computed explicitly and in particular, the determinant of the Hessian is non-positive. And one thing to note is that in each of these cases, in each of these um, two plus one dimensional cases which have been uh, which have been studied the the correlation structure uh, in the stationary measure is determinantal so these these Gibbs measures can be viewed as a uh, determinantal point process meaning that um, meaning that yeah so correlation functions are determinants um, and so okay um, so we'll present the dynamics on height functions 
with stationary measures given by the Gibbs measures of the six vertex model. And unlike in the Dimer case, in general, the Gibbs measures of six vertex model are not in general determinantal. And so that's sort of one uh, key difference between a lot of between this and a lot of the work that has been uh, done before, or between the situation and the Dimer situation. And um, in the case of stochastic weights, we compute the uh, current explicitly for a particular one parameter family of Gibbs measures. Okay. So now I will uh, define the six vertex model um, and define the relevant probability measures. I guess uh, most likely uh, a lot of you are very familiar with the six vertex model, but anyways, I'll go over this. Um, so uh, a state uh, in the a configuration, a six vertex configuration in the on the square lattice is a configuration of um, of lattice paths which move up and to the right. And these lattice paths can sort of touch at a vertex, but they can't cross or, or share an edge. And so there's a sort of there's a sort of canonical way to associate each uh, path configuration a height function defined on the faces of the lattice, um, such that at each uh, such that at each at each vertex the height function has one of these six uh, local configurations at the four faces around the vertex. And so, namely, if I cross a an edge, if I cross a path going upwards or to the left, then my height increases by one. And if I cross a path going down or to the right, then my height decreases by one. That's how one obtains a height function from a, from a path configuration. And so as we sort of mentioned on the previous slide, there are six possible local configurations. And then one must assign a weight to each of these uh, local configurations. So usually one denotes uh, the six weights as A1, A2, B1, B2, and C1 and C2. And for most of our discussion, we'll be considering uh, the special case of stochastic weights, which is where A1 and A2 are equal to one and B1 plus C1 is equal to one and B2 plus C2 is equal to one. So the things that, so what B1 and C1 have in common is that the, the entering edge from the left, the entering edges have the same configuration. So B1 and C1 both have the property that the entering edge from the left and the entering, the entering edge from the left is empty and the bottom edge is occupied. And then similarly for B2 and C2, the entering edges have the same uh, have the same occupation status. Okay, so this is a two-parameter family uh, of weights. We just choose uh, B1 and B2, and we also refer to those as delta one and delta two. Okay, so how does one uh, sample a configuration uh, from the from the stochastic six vertex model? So suppose that I have some just finite rectangular region of vertices. And suppose that I have some fixed um, entrance data, boundary, uh, fixed boundary condition, fixed entering boundary conditions. So what that means is just I fix the entering locations for the paths. Um, so how do I sample a configuration? First, I look at this bottom left uh, vertex, and I see that it has a path incoming from the left and no path coming from the bottom. So I look at uh, the, the vertices which in the table which have that property, and these are B1 and C1, and these add up to one. So um, I can flip a coin with probability B1 uh, to see what con what configuration I should put at this vertex. So say I flip the coin, and then I get um, I get oh sorry maybe I I'm not sure if I misspoke, but yeah I was flipping coin with probability B2, and I got uh, C2. So I, I chose this um, at this vertex. There's uh, both edges entering are empty, so there's only one option. So I don't need to do anything to sample. And then I look at this vertex now, and I see that there's an edge coming in from the bottom and no edge coming from the left. So I flip a coin with probability B1. So I do that, and I get the I get C1. And then I just I repeat this process now at this vertex. I get that configuration. So now that I've done this, I have all the data that I need to uh, now sample the second row of vertices in the same way. Which I can do, and then, and then again, I sample now the top row. So now, uh, using this 
using this Markov chain, we've sampled the configuration of paths with this entrance data, which we specified, and with uh, any exit locations for the paths. And uh, this has a property that the, that the probability of a particular configuration will be exactly equal to the product of the weights of all the vertices. Okay, so I just wanna, uh, so I wanna make a, a few more definitions. So I wanna just define what is a Gibbs measure. So we say that a probability measure on path configurations in the square lattice, so the, the, the probability measure on six vertex configurations in the square lattice is a Gibbs measure if for any rectangle, so I fix, uh, I have some rectangle, and if um, the conditional distribution of the state inside the rectangle, given some fixed uh, boundary conditions, so given the entrance and exit locations of paths on the rectangle, this conditional distribution should be um, given by the Boltzmann measure. So it should be the probability of some state inside the rectangle should be proportional to the product of the weights inside the rectangle. So here Z is just a normalizing constant, which only depends on the, on the boundary conditions. And, um, and this W of B S denotes the weight of the vertex in that state S. Okay, and then now I'm gonna define uh, how to sample from, a, I'm gonna define a certain uh, special family of Gibbs measures of the six vertex model. And in order to do that, I need to explain, uh, I need to define uh, a way to actually sample the boundary, the entrance boundary conditions on a, on some uh, sort of rectangular region in the square lattice. So say that I have some uh, quadrant, say like the upper right quadrant of Z2. And um, I define ST Bernoulli entrance data on this quadrant as follows. So, so again, this, this is a probability measure on the entrance location, on the set of entrance locations for paths on this quadrant. So the definition is that horizontal edges uh, are occupied with a path with probability T and vertical edges are occupied with a path with probability S and all of these are independent. So that is uh, ST Bernoulli entrance data. And okay, now using this, finally I can define the, um, the relevant Gibbs measures. Okay, so we have these two parameters, delta one and delta two, which uh, fix the, the stochastic weights. And uh, for each row between zero and one, we define a translation invariant Gibbs measure. First, uh, as a function of rho, I, I have this other quantity phi rho, which is also between uh, zero and one, and depends on the weights and on rho. And so I do the following thing. In order to sample from this measure, uh, which we will call pi rho, in order to sample from pi rho, I need to know how to sample the six vertex configuration on any finite uh, subset of the, of the square lattice. So I'll explain how to sample the configuration on a quadrant. So say that I have this quadrant with lower left uh, vertex x, y. I sample the entrance locations for paths on the quadrant according to the, uh, according to row five row uh, Bernoulli entrance data probability measure. So I just sample the, the incoming vertical edges independently to have a path with probability row and the horizontal edges with probability five row. And then given some entrance data uh, on, the, on the quadrant, I use, my, I use my Markovian sampling procedure to sample the configuration. And so um, there's a consistency check uh, to do here, but it, it's just, um, yeah, so uh, one can do that. And indeed, this defines a translation invariant uh, Gibbs measure. So now finally, I'll define the, uh, the uh, Markov process and uh, state the, the main theorems. So there's sort of two, um, there's sort of two main uh, ingredients in the uh, definition of the process. So there's, there are, um, the, there's the sort of initiation of jumps. So we think of uh, each vertical edge as having a, uh, 
a Poisson clock attached to it. And when these Poisson clock rings, if the local configuration is uh, appropriate, then there will be some jump that is initiated and then these jumps will propagate. So first I'm gonna explain what the jumps actually look like and then I'll uh, explain the, the jump rates, which are a function of the local configuration around each vertical edge. So um, there's two types of jumps that can happen. There's uh, which we call up jumps and down jumps. So in an up jump, this occupied horizontal edge here um, next to this clock, which rings, this occupied horizontal edge here uh, jumps upwards and then occupies this edge. And sort of a maximal string of adjacent uh, occupied horizontal edges, which also can jump up, are then forced to jump up. So this uh, propagation even goes past uh, this uh, sort of barrier here. So it so even though this horizontal edge is part of a new path, it still is forced to jump up from this ring. So this so the jump initiated by this ring in this configuration looks like this. Okay, and then the propagation of the down jump is exactly the same. So if a down jump happens, this uh, edge will jump down, and then sort of a maximal string of a of of adjacent edges will also jump down to sort of correct the configuration, make it a, and make it a valid six vertex configuration. Okay, and so, uh, so yeah, as I said, the 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 rates of these Poisson clocks attached to the vertical edges depend on the local configuration there at that instant in time. So, and so here are the so here are the rates and. Here, Q and U are a different, are two parameters which give a different way of parameterizing the the six vertex weights. So these these are the jump rates. Okay, so the the, the theorem is the following. So the, this Markov chain is well defined from a set of states which is probability one under the Gibbs measure pi over rho. So we have some uh, infinite state space, and uh, out of a generic state, there are uh, there are infinitely any infinitely many jumps out of a sort of a generic state in the state space. So one must be sure that it makes sense to even, uh, that it makes sense to sample a configuration from pi rho and then run the, the run the Markov chain. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that pi rho is a stationary measure for this Markov process for each row. And finally, if we denote the current by J of rho U, so u is the depend the dependence on the weights is through this parameter u, and the dependence uh, on the slope is through rho. So the the current has this explicit formula. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to quickly mention this. And this, uh, this part, there's one more uh, result that I want to quickly mention, but I'll just go over quickly. And then if there's time at the end, we can come back to it or if anyone has any questions, we can discuss. Um, so uh, one can also put the, one can also consider the six vertex model uh, on the torus. And um, if I look at some uh, fundamental domain, uh, of the of the of this toroidal lattice, um, then I can write down a height function, and it turns out that um, the there's a well-defined sort of so if I make if I make one uh, horizontal uh, if I make a loop around the torus in a horizontal direction, then the height change in that direct the overall height change is well-defined. For a, for a six vertex state, in the sense that no matter which uh, representative of that homology class I choose, I'll get the same height change. So I consider the state space of um, path configurations with fixed uh, height changes in the horizontal and vertical directions. And um, and so th these correspond to like choosing the average slope of the of the of the height. So again, so uh, we can, there's sort of a natural way to, uh, so 
uh, in the case of the torus, we consider general six vertex weights. And there's sort of a natural way to put this um, Markov chain on the torus. And one has to figure out how to write the rates in terms of the general six vertex weights. And it turns out that one can do it like this. And um, so as before, these, these vertical edges initiate jumps. And the propagation works in the same way. There's some small uh, caveats to, or maybe there's some small uh, differences that one might want to consider on the torus, like propagation can sort of loop all the way around. And um, so the, the result is just that this Markov chain on the torus uh, preserves the Boltzmann measure on this, on this state space. And one can see this work of uh, Borden and Bufetov and compare this Markov chain to the Markov chain that they describe, which also uh, preserves the same measures. And um, it's sort of interesting because this Markov chain looks very similar to ours, but there's there doesn't appear to be any obvious way to transform ours into theirs or vice versa. So it seems like they are uh, similar in some ways, but ultimately different. Okay, and now um, I just want to make one comment. I want to so now I want to go back to focusing on the dynamics in the full plane in the in the square lattice Z two, and I want to just try to give some indication of what goes into that first point, saying that the dynamics are well defined. And uh, why they're, and I just want to try to explain what type of uh, problem might arise. So, um, and, and yeah, the, the reason I want to, yeah, because that sort of ends up being one of the main technical, I guess, difficulties of the work. So, so suppose that I have this uh, configuration in the square lattice with just one path, which is completely flat. So, this is sort of a bad initial configuration. And the reason for that is that one can uh, convince oneself that sort of the, the only, uh, so one can convince oneself that if one did try to run the dynamics starting from this configuration, then this edge here would sort of, in any finite amount of time, would sort of shoot up to infinity. It would just travel arbitrarily far up. So sort of the, the only reasonable maybe definition for the dynamics from this initial configuration is that this path disappears, but we kind of don't want, we kind of don't want that. So uh, we say that this, we say that the dynamics are sort of not well-defined from this configuration. Or in any case, this is sort of the, the problem that can arise. So on the other hand, if I have this path with some sort of non-zero average slope, then we don't have this issue of long range propagation of jumps. So here the main issue is that jumps, uh, Poisson clocks infinitely far to the left will lead to a jump here. But this doesn't happen in this case. So one can convince oneself that um, this path will just sort of move a, a finite distance. And one, one can, in fact, define the Markov chain from starting from this initial configuration. And then so in general, when there are more paths present, then one must uh, so if we remember in the dynamics, the jumps can actually propagate from one path to another. So one has to be just a little bit careful to make sure that we don't have this issue of long range uh, propagation of jumps uh, to make sure that things sort of don't go off to infinity. Oops. Okay, so um, now I just want to try to describe uh, how uh, we uh, came to studying this this Markov chain and how it sort of uh, comes from the Yang-Back circuit for the six vertex one. Okay, so in general, if I have two, if I have a stochastic weight function, it can be uh, or a stochastic weight function has two parameters: the spectral parameter u. So this is just a way to parameterize. Uh, stochastic weights by a spectral parameter u and another parameter q. And two weight functions with the same value of q and different spectral parameters u and v can be related by the Yang-Baxter equation. So the Yang-Baxter equation is sort of di diagrammatically uh, shown like this. And what this means is that if I fix 
for any fixed choice of I1, I2, I3, J1, J2, and J3, which specify the boundary conditions uh, on this three on each side of this equation, on the diagram on each side of this equation, the uh, corresponding partition functions are equal. So we note that for the lattice on the left-hand side, uh, the, part, the weight function for a configuration uses the spectral parameter u on the bottom vertex here and v on the top vertex. And on the right-hand side, it uses v on the bottom vertex and u on the top vertex. So the spectral parameters are, are swapped. And there's a special weight function which is used on the, on the cross vertex uh, on both sides. And it's sort of, I guess it's sort of not relevant to us at the moment, but So that's the Yang-Baxter equation, and at least in terms of the in terms of the vertex model. And so, just to illustrate some of the, I guess, to just review some of the standard uh, arguments that uh, one can do using the Yang-Baxter equation, we can see from the Yang-Baxter equation that if we have this two-row lattice, um, which sort of starts. So yeah, if we have this, if we have this two-row lattice with some uh, specified boundary conditions, so we have paths entering on the left, and some specified boundary condition on the bottom and top, then uh, the partition function uh, using the stochastic weights corresponding to u on the first row and v on the second row is equal to the partition function where we swap u and v. Okay, so how do we see this? So we can add a cross on the left. This will preserve the partition function because the cross is weight one. And then we can sort of we can move the cross past this first column. And by the Yang-Baxter equation, this preserves the partition function. And then we can sort of uh, just we can just iterate this until the cross is to the right of all the paths. Say that just for some, say that we have uh, just finally many paths. Um, so we can move the cross to the right until it's to the right of all the paths, and then we can remove it. And then we've swapped the at each step that we so at each column each time we move the cross past the column, we swap the spectral parameters there. So once we move it all the way through, we've swapped the spectral parameters. Okay. So our goal is now to, so the question that we asked, I guess, is what if we use the Yang-Baxter equation to give us a procedure, to give us a resampling procedure in the following sense. So if I fix, boundary conditions on the left, on the lattice on the left-hand side, then there's some Boltzmann measure uh, on, on path configurations on the left-hand side. And we'd like to find transition probabilities. And so the same is true uh, of the lattice on the right-hand side. There's some natural, there's some Boltzmann measure, namely just the probability of a configuration is proportional to, the, to its weight. And so, um, we'd like to find transition probabilities, which given a, so these are uh, probabilities which uh, are, are the probability, which um, give the probability of some uh, configuration on the lattice on the right-hand side, given one on the left-hand side. We'd like to um, choose these transition probabilities in such a way that these two Boltzmann measures are coupled. So it's sort of like algebraic, condition can be uh, written like this, where here um, S prime and S uh, have the same uh, boundary conditions. So it, for, as a concrete example, this is one, um, if I fix some concrete uh, boundary conditions, then this is one instance of the Yang-Baxter equation. And um, P forward allows me to sample uh, one of these two diagrams on the bottom, uh, such that the probability is the transition probability is proportional to the to the weight. Okay, so now we can sort of uh, at the level of uh, sort of diagrammatically, we can do the same argument, except now each time we drag the cross past a column, it's it represents a random. Uh, transition where we're sort of resampling the configuration. And at each step, instead of uh, preservation of partition functions, we have preservation of the corresponding probability measures. So if we have our two row lattice and we have some configuration, which is sampled from the uh, 
sampled from the stochastic six vertex model. Then we can add a cross on the left and move it through according to these transition probabilities, move it past the first column according to these transition probabilities. Um, and then we obtain a state which is sampled from the stochastic six vertex model on this lattice with a cross here. And so we can sort of repeat this and we have this preservation of measures at each step. And so ultimately, again, we can move the cross uh, all the way through. And then once it's past all the paths, we can just remove it without affecting the, the probability measure, the Boltzmann measure. And so ultimately, if I just call these, if I call the, the transition probabilities arising from uh, this whole process, so adding across the left and then dragging it all the way through, if I call these denote U, the transition kernel that we get from that, then if I sample uh, a configuration on this lattice with U on the bottom and V on top, and then, uh, and then sample a new state from U, then I get uh, a sample of a six vertex model with V on the bottom and U on top. Okay, so now using this as our sort of uh, fundamental uh, building block, this U, we're going to uh, define a discrete time Markov chain and then take a continuous time limit of that discrete time Markov chain. So I need to make one more, uh, yeah, one more definition. So I want to define the stochastic six vertex model in a quadrant. So um, first I take a sequence of uh, spectral parameters and I wanna use the weight function. And so um, U1 determines the weight function that is used on the first row of the lattice. U2 determines the weight function used in the second row, et cetera. And I start with boundary conditions where there's paths entering from the left and the uh, bottom edges are empty. And I use, so then given these boundary conditions and these uh, weight functions, I use the Markovian sampling procedure to sample the configuration in this uh, upper right quadrant. Okay, so that's the six vertex model in the quadrant. And um, we denote it like this uh, with P sub bold U. And if, if all the U's are equal to some fixed U, then we just denote it by P U. So now, if I, so now I can use my, I can, we can use the procedure of dragging the cross through randomly, which we called, and we called one uh, sort of entire step of that, uh, this, cap, this transition kernel capital U. Um, I can add a, so yeah, I can add a cross between the first two rows and drag it through. And then what this does at the level of, at the level of the stochastic six vertex model measure is it swaps the spectral parameters. So I can sort of swap U1 with U2 by applying this U. And then I can again swap uh, U1 with U3 by applying this U, which corresponds to adding across between the second and third row and dragging it through. And then I can, uh, and so I can just continue doing this. And I can just keep on pushing U1 further and further up. And so because uh, the stochastic six vertex model can be sampled according to some Markov chain, the, the measures that I get uh, for, U, for U1 being very high up are sort of are consistent. So I can take a limit where, uh, I, where U1 sort of goes to infinity and disappears. So if I define this shift operator S um, as the operator which just takes in a sequence and shifts it one to the left, then we get this uh, Markov transition kernel which at the level of measures just shifts the spectral parameters down by one. It just takes U1 and sends it to infinity. And so again, to, to reiterate, the sampling procedure for this uh, L of U is I add a cross between the first two rows and drag it through. And then I add a cross between the second two rows and drag it through. And I add a cross between the third, the third row and the fourth row and drag it through, et cetera. Okay. Um, Okay, so now we'd like to um, uh, take a, so this, this is the, uh, this is the, the single step uh, transition, which we'll try to get a, from which we'll try to get a continuous time limit. And
And so, okay, so in order to do this, one just notes that when transitioning according to U, where the spectral parameters are U and V on the two, uh, on the two rows of the lattice, the probability that any jump happens is proportional to V minus U. So the goal is, so what we do basically, I'm just, I'm not gonna uh, talk about these formulas, I guess, but what we do is we choose the spectral parameters such that every time we swap two spectral parameters, they're very close to each other. And then we can repeat this procedure many times and, uh, or so, so we can do many steps of this chain and we expect to see a continuous time limit. Um, so again, so I can choose the spectral parameters like this. And then if I, um, so yeah, if I make the appropriate uh, time scale change and then take this parameter, see, I, I had this parameter epsilon in the spectral parameters. So I make the appropriate time scale change and send epsilon to zero, I get this continuous time limit. And we get a markup, we get a continuous time markup chain on, which acts on uh, six vertex configurations in the quarter plane. And the jumps and the jump, the jumps work exactly in the same way as I described before for the full plane markup chain, uh, except there's this uh, spatial inhomogeneity in the jump rates. So if this uh, local configuration is at height k, then I pre-multiply the jump rate by k. So just to illustrate this in the picture, um, this uh, this vertical edge is Poisson clock that is at is at height five. So I pre-multiply the rate by height five, and then after this jump happens, then this one is going to occur with rate six six a. So that's how the quarter plane markup chain works. And if I sort of go back and look at um, and look at how the uh, look at how many steps of the discrete time uh, markup chain acted on the stochastic six vertex model measure. And then, uh, so I, I get some equation, uh, which, is set, which is, is restating the preservation of the measures or the um, how it acts on the measures. And then I can sort of take epsilon to zero in this equation and I get this equation for how the continuous time markup chain in the quadrant uh, changes, the, changes the measure. So if I have just a homogeneous six vertex model with spectral parameter U on every row, then running this continuous time markup chain for time tau changes the spectral parameter in this way, just continuously deforms the spectral parameter. Okay. Um, okay, so now I'd like to explain from this markup chain how the uh, full plane markup chain arises. So it just a tiny bit more context. So this is just a review of the limit shape theorem for the stochastic six vertex model in a quadrant. So suppose that I have spectral parameter u on every row and I sample a stochastic six vertex model, then this renormalized height function will converge in probability to some deterministic limit. And um, okay, so by that theorem, we know that um, so Now, suppose that uh, I'm, I'm running the markup chain, uh, this quarter plane markup chain, and I look at uh, the point in the lattice corresponding to the macroscopic coordinates uh, x, y. So I look here. Um, then if I just look at the path configuration near that point, um, it's also, it's another theorem that um, I'll approximately see some Gibbs measure. And the the parameter rho of that, so I'll see one of those KPZ phase Gibbs measures that I defined before, and the parameter rho of that Gibbs measure will be determined by the gradient of the height function of the limiting height function there. And uh, furthermore, so if I'm at this macroscopic point, so I'm actually on the, in lattice coordinates, I'm very high up. So due to that inhomogeneity, things are sort of happening very fast. But if I um, sort of normalize that out, this overall if, it, if I sort of normalize that out, then uh, if I look at what the markup chain is doing here, then it's then the rates are sort of becoming homogeneous. It sort of it sort of gets rid of that inhomogeneity, and there's just some uh, some non-trivial uh, jumps happening here. There's some non-trivial markup chain acting here, and that's the that's the Gibbs measure markup chain. So that's where the the jump rates of the the full plane markup chain 
comes from. That's where the full plane Markov chain comes from. It's, a, it's by looking in the, that's how we, anyways, that's just some motivation for defining it. Um, so we define this quarter plane Markov chain, which acts nicely on the measures, and then look in the bulk and we see the, Gib and we see the Gibbs measure preserving Markov chain. Okay. And, okay, so as an application, uh, of all this, or just sort of putting all this together, there's a nice check that uh, we can do. So one of the parts of the theorem was that we were able to compute the current and sort of by our uh, general, by our general reasoning, um, by our general reasoning, we sort of expect that the limiting height function should satisfy some hydrodynamic limit equation. Uh, where the rate of growth is essentially determined by the current. Except, so this is, I'm talking now about the quarter plane Markov chain. So I need to include actually these, uh, these prefactors, um, which account for the inhomogeneity in the, in the rates, because this J is really actually coming from the homogeneous uh, Markov chain, the Markov chain where the rates are homogeneous in the full plane. So, I sort of need to add in these, uh, and there, there's so there's this inhomogeneity from space, and then there's also a time inhomogeneity, which I just didn't mention before, but just a, it's a minor thing. And um, but anyways, once we get all those prefactors right, we expect that H will satisfy this hydrodynamic limit equation. And for this step initial condition, it's computed in this work of Borden, Corwin, and Gorin that the height function is exactly given by this formula, uh, at least inside the. Okay, so. Inside this, uh, inside this cone here, uh, the height function is given by that. It's given by that formula, and one can check that indeed this function of x, y, and tau um, satisfies this differential equation. So I guess that's not uh, the the goal of this is not to give a proof of some theorem, but it's just uh, at least. It's a nice uh, check that we computed the current correctly and that all of the general reasoning was correct. Okay. Um, and so uh, what are some natural uh, next, next questions? Um, so if we have some, so if we have stochastic weights, um, the phase diagram uh, for the six vertex for the stochastic six vertex model looks like this. So what I mean is, um, if S denotes the x direction slope of the height function, Y denotes the t, and t denotes the y direction slope, then inside this um, lens shape, there are no ergodic Gibbs measures for this for the stochastic six vertex model, and outside of it. And on the boundary, there are ergodic Gibbs measures. And the one parameter family that we define corresponds to the, this boundary of this, uh, of this shape. And so uh, one question that one uh, natural question which one might ask is, what if we start uh, from some fixed initial configuration instead of from some configuration which is sampled from a, a nice stochastic six vertex model measure? What if we start from some fixed initial configuration? Can we still, and, and supposing that this initial configuration has slopes which are always on this on this curve, on this KPZ phase, oops. Supposing that the configuration always has uh, local slopes on this curve, can we still prove the hydrodynamic limit equation? Because uh, we expect uh, we expect something like that to be true. Um, uh, another question is, can we, if we move away from this curve, so we only computed the current on this curve, if we move away from this curve, can we still compute the current or can we compute something uh, about the current? Or maybe for other choices of six vertex weights, where at least we have the Markov chain defined on the torus, um, can we? Uh, is it possible to say anything about the current, or can we at least say enough about it to determine the sign of the determinant of its Hessian, and check whether this is an anisotropic or isotropic KPZ growth model? And so, uh, it's probably it's it seems likely that there's no good general explicit formula in terms of the two slopes for the current, because the current is sort of closely related to the 
surface tension functional of the function of the model. And it seems that, uh, for, it's my understanding that it seems like there should be no good, uh, uh, no nice formula for the surface tension uh, for the six vertex model, as, as, like away from this uh, curve. Um, so yeah, so this, so maybe it's a very hard question to actually compute the current exactly, but uh, maybe it's possible to at least um, determine which class we're in, or, or maybe it's possible to give some perturbative uh, calculation of the current as you move away from this curve or as you change the weights from uh, the free from fermionic point uh, to non free fermionic. Oh, yeah. Anyways, that's it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Okay.